This is the cross of the zodiac, one of the oldest conceptual images in human history. So this video is probably the best understanding and rendition you will ever get to understanding the universe and understanding uh, how the ages come about, okay? So, like he said, this is called the cross of the zodiac. And it's like, whoa, oh, it's getting into the horoscope. Ah. It's not. It's not. What happened is people had to put names to the things that they saw in the sky. Like we call stars stars, but a cluster of stars that we see positioned in the same way every day. If you and I were just friends and every night we saw this cluster of stars and we gave them a name and said, look, we're going to call that cluster over there Eric we're gonna call that cluster over there uh, harmony you know it's it's just a way of describing and so let this breakdown give you the understanding of the parts that you're missing because remember after all we're talking about coming out of the loop and circle of life we're talking about the circle of life and coming out of the loop of it okay that's the ultimate goal it reflects the sun as it figuratively passes through the 12 major constellations. So this represents how the sun, because the sun travels, we know that. And we see it every day. We see it come up for us, go somewhere. Where does it go? Right? We see it. So this is a representation of the traveling of the sun. This is where the sun's going. This is the knowledge that humans have brought forth to understand the behavior of these heavenly bodies over the course of a year. It also reflects the 12 months of the year, the four seasons, and the solstices and equinoxes. So it said this represents the 12 months of the year, the four seasons. The term zodiac relates to the fact that constellations were anthropomorphized or personified as figures or anthropomorphized or personified as figures that's the naming of it that's like how I just said how if we saw a cluster of stars that we observed every night and we gave them a name we could call them whatever we want right so that's all that has been done so that humans could understand what they were looking at like oh no that's Aries you know that's the ram because of the shape that the stars were in that's how we were able to gather an understanding of it so these things were anthropomorphized is what that's called we should just say they were named <laughs> but being anthropomorphized like they were given animal names human like names you know if you know have you heard of the great uh, the big dipper little dipper same thing animals in other words, the early civilizations did not just follow the sun and stars, they personified them with elaborate myths involving their movements and relationships. The sun, with its life-giving and saving qualities, was personified as a representative of the unseen creator or God, God's sun, the light of the world, the savior of humankind. So when they said the sun, well, you heard what he said, okay? That's the name that was given to it, God's sun, right? They didn't say God was the sun. They gave it the name of God's sun because something's moving it around and it's doing something. The light, you know, uh, activates soil, all kind of thing. They called it God's sun and they watched how God's sun moved around. Likewise, the 12 constellations represented places of travel for God's sun and were identified by names, usually representing elements of nature that happened during that period of time. For example, Aquarius, the water bearer who brings the spring rains. So, uh oh, I should have moved that. I hope it's still in position where you can see it, right? That's what we're talking about, okay? So, Earth has a rotation in the cosmos and the sky. The location shifts roughly every 2100 years, plus or minus, okay? Let's just continue watching. Okay, and here's where it starts to feel taboo for most, but if you listen, you can have a good understanding and learn something. 
This is Horus. He is the sun god of Egypt of around 3000 BC. He is the sun anthropomorphized and his life is a series of allegorical myths involving the sun's movement in the sky. From the ancient hieroglyphics in Egypt we know much about the solar messiah. For instance Horus being the sun or the light had an enemy known as Set and Set was the And this is he's just giving this is caught from a film called Zeitgeist and he was giving just historical facts that were found in tombs in Egypt in the Vatican from all of those you know documents and stuff like that this is some of the oldest human writings about these things what he's referencing and and sharing here personification of the darkness or night and metaphorically speaking every morning Horus would win the battle against Set while in the evening Set would conquer Horus and send him into the underworld it is important to note that dark versus light or good versus evil is one of the most ubiquitous mythological dualities ever known and is still expressed on many levels to this day broadly speaking the story of Horus is as follows Horus was born on December 25th of the virgin Isis Mary his birth was accompanied by a star in the east, which, in turn, three kings followed to locate and adorn a newborn savior. At the age of 12, he was a prodigal child teacher, and at the age of 30, he was baptized by a figure known as Anup, and thus began his ministry. Horus had 12 disciples he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestural names such as the Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, and many others. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. These attributes of Horus, whether original or not, seem to permeate in many cultures of the world, for many other gods are found to have the same general mythological structure. Attis of Phrygia, born of the virgin Nana on December 25th, crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days, was resurrected. Krishna of India, born of the virgin Devaki, with a star in the east, signaling his coming. He performed miracles with his disciples, and, upon his death, was resurrected. So again, this is not saying, clearly, that there is not a god or nothing like that is being said is what is being highlighted is that this same type of story about god or a god span through all cultures dionysus of greece born of a virgin on december 25th was a traveling teacher who performed miracles such as turning water into wine he was referred to as the king of kings god's only begotten son the alpha and omega and many others and upon his death he was resurrected Mithra of Persia, born of a virgin on December 25th. He had 12 disciples and performed miracles, and upon his death was buried for three days and thus resurrected. He was also referred to as the Truth, the Light, and many others. Interestingly, the sacred day of worship of Mithra was Sunday. The fact of the matter is, there are numerous saviors from different periods from all over the world which subscribe to these general characteristics. The question remains, why these attributes? Why the virgin birth on December 25th? Why dead for three days in the inevitable resurrection? Why twelve disciples or followers? To find out, let's examine the most recent of the solar messiahs. Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary on December 25th in Bethlehem. His birth was announced by a star in the east, which three kings or magi followed to locate and adorn the new savior. He was a child teacher at twelve, and at the age of thirty he was baptized by John the Baptist, and thus began his ministry. Jesus had 12 disciples, which he traveled about with, performing miracles, such as healing the sick, walking on water, raising the dead. He was also known as the King of Kings, the Son of God, the Light of the World, the Alpha and Omega, the Lamb of God, and many, many others. After being betrayed by his disciple Judas and sold for 30 pieces of silver, he was crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days, was resurrected and ascended into heaven. First of all, the birth sequence is completely astrological. The star in the east is Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, which, on December 24th, aligns with the three brightest stars in Orion's belt. These three bright stars in Orion's belt are called today what they were called in ancient times, the Three Kings. And the Three Kings and the brightest star, Sirius, all point to the place of the sunrise on December 25th. This is why... All of this relates as above, so below. Okay? This is not changing the story this is showing the above part of the story by the three kings follow the story that we all know very well the star in the east in order to locate the sunrise the birth of the sun 
The Virgin Mary is the constellation Virgo, also known as Virgo the Virgin. Virgo in Latin means virgin. The ancient glyph for Virgo is the altered M. This is why Mary, along with other virgin mothers, such as Adonis's mother Myra, or Buddha's mother Maya, begin with an M. Virgo is also referred to as the house of bread, and the representation of Virgo is a virgin holding a sheaf of wheat. This house of bread and its symbol of wheat represents August and September, the time of harvest. In turn, Bethlehem, in fact, literally translates to house of bread. Bethlehem is thus a reference to the constellation Virgo, a place in the sky, not on Earth. There's another very interesting phenomenon that occurs around December 25th, or the winter solstice. From the summer solstice to the winter solstice, the days become shorter and colder. And from the perspective of the northern hemisphere, the sun appears to move south and get smaller and more scarce. The shortening of the days and the expiration of the crops when approaching the winter solstice symbolized the process of death to the ancients. It was the death of the sun. And by December 22nd, the sun's demise was fully realized. So they're showing that that's where the sun rises at those times it's a it's on a constant decline and we know that and we see that every year because it gets darker sooner right that's what it's talking about but the sun having moved south continually for six months makes it to its lowest point in the sky here so on december 22nd the sun is usually at its lowest point okay and we know this to be true because all of a sudden, a certain season changes, it starts getting cold, it starts getting darker earlier, and then on the December 22nd, we may not realize the sun is at its lowest point, where it rises at its lowest and declines at its lowest. A curious thing occurs. The sun stops moving south, at least perceivably, for three days. And during this three-day pause, the sun resides in the vicinity of the Southern Cross, or Crux, constellation. So for six months, the sun consistently declines in its location of where it's moving. And then on December 22nd, it stops the decline. And it's at its lowest point, and it doesn't move again. When it rises and comes back, it goes to the same position for three days. And after this time, on December 25th, the sun moves one degree, this time north, foreshadowing longer days, warmth, and spring. And thus it was said, the sun died on the cross, was dead for three days, only to be resurrected or born again. This is why Jesus and numerous other sun gods share the crucifixion, three-day death and resurrection concept. It is the sun's transition period before it shifts its direction back into the northern hemisphere, bringing spring and thus salvation. However, they did not celebrate the resurrection of the sun until the spring equinox, or Easter. This is because at the spring equinox, the sun officially overpowers the evil darkness, as daytime thereafter becomes longer in duration than the night, and the revitalizing conditions of spring emerge. Now, probably the most obvious of all the astrological symbolism around Jesus regards the twelve disciples. They are simply the twelve constellations of the zodiac, which Jesus, being the sun, travels about with. In fact, the number twelve is replete throughout the Bible. This text has more to do with astrology than anything else. Coming back to the cross of the zodiac, the figurative life of the sun, this was not just an artistic expression or tool to track the sun's movement. It was also a pagan spiritual symbol, the shorthand of which looked like this. This is not a symbol of Christianity. It is a pagan adaptation of the cross of the zodiac. This is why Jesus in early occult art is always shown with his head on the cross, for Jesus is the Son, the Son of God, the light of the world, the risen Savior who will come again, as it does every morning, the glory of God who defends against the works of darkness as he is born again every morning and can be seen coming in the clouds up in heaven with his crown of thorns or sun rays. Now, of the many astrological, astronomical metaphors in the Bible, one of the most important has to do with the ages. So, that is very interesting. That's an interesting concept, right? And it doesn't mean that whatever you learned about whatever religion you believe in, it doesn't say that it's not true. We can regard it simply as the above version of the story.
you know we have the you know how they how it says as above so below so we don't have to dismiss this as something ungodly or this must be some atheist type stuff no this is the above version of the same story that we all know okay and it's important that we know this because it relates to our everyday life understanding the way that the elements the earth the sun interact with us we cannot continue to go about life not understanding this so if you're a very religious person consider that god may want you to know this don't think it's ungodly this is god is sharing this knowledge with you consider it as that because we cannot continue to go forth without having a good understanding of this we need to know this we need to understand what age we are in throughout the scriptures there are numerous references to the age in order to understand this we need to be familiar with a phenomenon known as the procession of the equinoxes the ancient Egyptians, along with cultures long before them, recognized that approximately every 2150 years, the sunrise on the morning of the spring equinox would occur at a different sign of the zodiac. This has to do with a slow, angular wobble that the Earth maintains as it rotates on its axis. It is called a procession because the constellations go backwards rather than through the normal yearly cycle. The amount of time it takes for the procession to go through all 12 signs is roughly 25,765 years. This is also called the Great Year, and ancient societies were very aware of this. And they referred to each 2100. So it goes through an age roughly every 2,000 years. Okay? So it's the same as how it was when it rises. And then for six months, it has the sun has a certain angle where it rises and falls. And then it stops at a certain angle. And we know this because then it's it starts meaning that it doesn't rise completely above the earth. It only rises at a certain angle. So then it gets darker sooner for us and then it shifts to another angle this shift is talking about every another shift that it makes a shift that it makes only every 2000 or so years okay and each and though each of those shifts is in a is laid out into 12 different shifts that we know as what we call the age and we have anthropomorphized okay we have given a name to those ages as aries pisces taurus uh, we give that name okay 50 year period as an age from 4300 bc to 2150 bc it was the age of taurus the bull from 2150 bc to 1 a.d it was the age of aries the ram and from 1 a.d to 2150 a.d it is the age of pisces the age we are still in to this day and in and around 2150, we will enter the new age, the age of Aquarius. So in around 2150, we are entering the new age. So we're on the cuffs of it, okay? We're knocking on the door of Aquarius. We, we are essentially in the age of Aquarius, even though it's officially in at 2150 years, we are there, okay? We are there. Now, the Bible reflects, broadly speaking, a symbolic movement through three ages while foreshadowing a fourth. In the Old Testament, when Moses comes down Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, he is very upset to see his people worshipping a golden bull calf. In fact, he shattered the stone tablets and instructed his people to kill each other in order to purify themselves. Most biblical scholars will attribute this anger to the fact that the Israelites were worshipping a false idol or something to that effect. The reality is, the golden bull is Taurus the bull and Moses represents the new age of Aries the Ram. This is why Jews even today still blow the Ram's horn. Moses represents the new age of Aries. Now upon the new age, everyone must shed the old age. Other deities mark these transitions as well, such as Mithra, a pre-Christian god who kills the bull in the same symbology. Now Jesus is the figure who ushers in the age following Aries. The age because we have to remember that it goes backwards, okay? It goes backwards. So astrology, the first sign of the zodiac is what? Aries. Okay? But it goes backwards. So when we were in the age of the bull, which is Taurus, the sign that comes before Taurus is Aries. The signs that the sign that comes before Aries is Aquarius. Aquarius is 
January, right? Capricorn goes up until January, I don't know, 9th or so, 10th, maybe 15th, I don't know, something like that. And then it's the age of Aquarius, right? From January to, you know, that's monthly, the 12 months. This is according to the every 2,150 years is what we're talking about of the age. So there's the monthly and then there's the age of it. We travel through it monthly, yes, and annually, but then the earth axis stays into one of those for a period of 2,000 years. And it goes backwards, as mentioned. The age of Pisces, or the two fish. Fish symbolism is very abundant in the New Testament. Jesus feeds 5,000 people with bread and two fish. When he begins his ministry walking along Galilee, he befriends two fishermen who follow him. And I think we've all seen the Jesus fish in the back of people's cars. Little do they know what it actually means. It is a pagan astrological symbolism for the sun's kingdom during the age of Pisces. Also, Jesus' assumed birth date is essentially the start of this age. At Luke 22.10, when Jesus is asked by his disciples where the next Passover will be after he is gone, Jesus replies, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. This scripture is by far one of the most revealing of all the astrological references. The man bearing the pitcher of water is Aquarius, the water bearer, who is always pictured as a man pouring out a pitcher of water. He represents the age after Pisces, and when the sun pouring God's out a pitcher of water. He represents the age after Pisces, and when the sun, God's son, leaves the age of Pisces, Jesus, it will go into the house of Aquarius, as Aquarius follows Pisces in the procession of the equinoxes. All Jesus is saying is that after the age of Pisces will come the age of Aquarius. Now, we have all heard about the end times and the end of the world. The cartoonish depictions in the book of Revelation aside, the main source of this idea comes from Matthew 28:20, where Jesus says, I will be with you even to the end of the world. However, in the King James Version, world is a mistranslation, among many mistranslations. The actual word being used is eon, which means age. I will be with you even to the end of the age, which is true, as Jesus' solar Piscean personification will end when the sun enters the age of Aquarius. The entire concept of end times and the end of the world is a misinterpreted astrological allegory. Let's tell that to the approximately 100 million people in America who believe the end of the world is coming. from the Jesus story and the stars and constellations of the Zodiac um, on a film called Zeitgeist on YouTube. So we want to give credit where credit is due. And I use that because he has the best understanding of age, astronomy, and 12 signs of constellations. Okay? So when I created this, a lot of people kept emailing me like I don't understand what you mean so when you go to that on my website I have that video embedded he's getting his credit where credit is due it's right here as mentioned it's called the Jesus story so if you're on the website I did everything I could to break down the understanding of how um, the ages are anthropomorphized and all of that um, but that is the best rendition so again with each age, we are presented with an opportunity to come out of that vicious cycle and circle of life of eating one's own tail, okay? With each age, and so now since we are coming into the age of Aquarius, and on the website, what I have here is up to the current time, what was taking place during that age okay so when you see here like generation alpha generation z that's generations back that's different times of the age of aquarius um through the life through the entire lifespan um the same with every age in the age of aries i have oops that's the one thing i don't like about 
navigating this is that you can get lost but so like the age of Aries if you go on to it you can go on to the age of ancient Egypt and Nubia it goes on and on and on if you go to uh, you can see the different you know specific astrology and stuff but when you're looking at age the age of Taurus was the bull or the cow age. The age of Gemini, there was the bronze age, the trade and communication age. In the ages of Cancers, there was the great mother age and security age. From Leo, I have the superiority and first capitalization age. Uh, age of Virgo, humanity age. Scorpio, uh, talked about Sirius, the snake, dragon, and Neanderthal time. The age of Libra was the initial age of the hermaphrodite deities. Um, the age of Sagittarius, I talk about the Canara times, okay, and the Himavanta times. It, I, I go as deep as one can go. If, if you're paying attention to this, you can get a lot of information like here the cyano age this is the cyano bacteria in the age of Apric in the age of capricorn this is talking about f from the time of life on earth as we know it i go all the way back to cyano bacteria times okay but anyhow um so if you want to see what was taking place in different ages and different times so currently we are coming into a new opportunity to where we can come out of this loop of life, okay? The opportunity or the loop of life, okay? That's this. We can go back into the circle when we come into this new age, or it is a time of change. And the reason why it's an opportunity is because there's a shift in thinking at this time. See, memetics are social mores. Memetics are things that we subscribe to mentally that really don't change for eons alone, you know? So, like, the memetics of religion, stuff like that. Like, he talked about in the video how, um, well, that's a different idea. But anyhow, so let's just take a look and see if you have a full understanding so we are currently in the age of Pisces the age of Pisces begin in the year 1 AD and will span to the year 2150 AD in this moment it is the month of December of the year 2019 when I made this AD and so we are in the last days of the Pisces age with just 131 years to go okay so the coming age is the age of Aquarius. The ages get their name from the stars that cluster together in shapes known as constellations. If a group of stars clustered together look like a certain shape, that shape is the constellation. For example, the Big Dipper is a constellation that resembles a large ladle or spoon. Okay? So there you have it there. And these are all the constellations, the constellation of Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces. Okay. There are 12 primary constellations. A 13th constellation is said to have been omitted overall to align with the 12 moons of stars that the sun travels through annually, yearly. But the Earth travels through these constellations only every 2,150 years, as mentioned earlier on this page. Okay? So the Sun travels through these constellations every year. The Earth itself travels through these constellations once every 2,150 years. The Earth spins fast, but only moves significantly every 2,000. 150 years okay so example picture a clock 
all right? The second hand on the clock zips around the clock circumference entirely in just a minute. So you know that second hand, it's not a second hand, it is a second hand, but it's the hand that counts the seconds. It's zipping around the clock every minute. Zoom, 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 right? But the hour hand only goes to one section every hour. That's the earth and the sun. So if you could picture the sun to be like the second hand, remember as above, so below. The sun moves around all the constellations like the second hand. It takes a year to do it. The earth moves around like the hour hand. And one hour for the earth is every 2,150 years. Okay? And it doesn't count.